Thank you, Randall, for those great comments and insight. We definitely appreciate that. I am Diana Lean, and I am the communication strategist for the Carbon Action Alliance. I'm very excited to welcome you to this next panel that focuses on community engagement and energy project siting. And we have a great lineup of speakers here with a wide range of expertise on this subject. Community engagement is an integral piece to the work that we do at the Great Plains Institute, but also at the Carbon Action Alliance. Our main focus here is to bridge the gap between public awareness and carbon management and industrial decarbonization technologies, as well as the deployment needed for these technologies. We understand carbon management technologies must be deployed at a robust rate and commercial scale quickly to reach our mid-century net zero goals. But we also know that communities are at the center of this transition and must be placed there as well. Our focus is on creating information and facilitating communication on what this transition looks like. And we also prioritize including and listening to what communities themselves have to say about what this transition can and should, like, should look like for themselves. As others here have said today, the engagement processes for these projects must be early, frequent, and inclusive. And the transparent sharing of information is really at the center of it all, which is the focus of the work that we do at the Carbon Action Alliance. So as you see at the registration table, we have resources delving into what carbon management is, industrial decarbonization technologies, as well as the common questions that arise when people first hear about these topics for the first time. And the central piece of our work here is collaboration, including listening to and utilizing the expertise of those immersed in supporting their local communities, like our esteemed speakers for this panel here today. So I'm excited to introduce them, and I believe they will be joining us shortly, but I'll give you a little preview and then the moderator can take it away. So we will have Arcelia Isaias Gastelum. Uh, we will have Aaron Middleton, Dr. Meron Tespier, and then the moderator, Ben Finzel. So when he comes up here, he will introduce them officially and they will speak about their own backgrounds. Thanks. Good afternoon, everybody. Wait a second, is this on now? Can you hear me? Nope, still not on. Oh, there we are. So I was going to make a joke about the coveted post-lunch spot, but you all came back from lunch. My goodness, this is a packed house. Thank you. <laughs> it must be these guys. I'm sure it's not, uh, I'm sure it's not me. It's these guys in this wonderful topic that we're going to talk about. So my name is Ben Finzel. Um, it is great to see all of you, although these lights are really bright. It is very hard to see. Um, we're going to have an interesting conversation for the next hour. Uh, I'm going to let our panelists introduce themselves. We're going to talk a little bit um, about some of these topics, and we're also going to have Q&A from the audience. So be thinking about questions you want to ask. Uh, be, think be thinking about sort of what you want us to address, and we'll try to make sure we cover as much as possible. So um, as you heard already, I am joined by, to my immediate right, your left, Arcelia Isis Gastelum, project manager from REN USA. She's going to talk about her company and also a little bit about who she is in a moment. Um, Aaron Middleton, who is the Director of Energy Equity at Carbon Solutions. Same for Aaron. You're going to hear a little bit about her. Uh, and then Marin Tespe, the Senior Policy Analyst for the Energy Program at the Bipartisan Policy Center. And Marin will talk about her organization and a little bit about her uh, background as well. And then we're going to jump right into it. So let's start with Arcelia. Yeah, thank you, Ben. Is this on? There it goes. Hi, everyone. Um, as you said, my name is Arcelia Isaias Gastelum, and I work for REN USA as well as manage the coalition from a Renew Mexico side. So I've had the really great privilege to work with rural communities, particularly um, out here. And a lot of what we do is a lot of education um, and community outreach specifically uh, with regards to renewable energy projects, especially the uh, utility scale level, um, as well as renewable infrastructure, which is, as we all know, a big piece too. Uh, hitting all of our carbon management goals. Um, but yeah, it's been really, really great to kind of see and have these conversations with people. Like people right now have a lot of questions as we're entering this era of like really massive transitions. Um, so we've been able to kind of bridge the gap to bring people to the table, um, particularly during the stage before projects are really up and running when there's opportunities to comment and to give feedback um, and to really turn people out for support 
um, as well as to have more of a reciprocal relationship so that we can get these projects up and running a lot sooner than it would have otherwise, but also so that it's done in collaboration uh, with our communities. So very happy to be here with uh, this wonderful panel. Thank you, and uh, I, I wanna point out also a local. So um, we have folks from all over the country that you're hearing from today and tomorrow, but a genuine local, so very exciting to have a New Mexican with us. Erin, over to you, a Thanks. former New Mexican. Yes, I'm so excited to be here, and um, I'm gonna take the opportunity to tell you a little bit about my experience in New Mexico. Um, even though it may not seem relevant, it has informed all of the work and how I think of energy as being so important. By a show of hands, has anybody heard about the Yazi Martinez lawsuit in New Mexico? So, great. So what has happened is some um, folks uh, sued the state of New Mexico for inequitable education. Um, this was brought by Native, Hispanic, and black families. It has been transformative in New Mexico. And I worked in public education during this period of time. And one of the things that we were supposed to do was take children's test scores present them to communities with maps that often showed how the kids were scoring, and then ask how communities felt they should improve. And the parallel to this in the energy community is, I can't even explain how important this is, because it's so similar to Justice 40. Justice 40 came out with these maps, told communities, here's how we think that you look, and here are some of the things that we're going to do in order to, to change how things should be. And we did outreach all over the state. I was part of parents' groups. We worked with um, different pueblos. We looked with different, different large districts, small districts. And I think the thing that that experience brought to me was, first of all, what a tenuous space this was when you're interacting with federal governments, state governments, and communities, some of whom just by hearing that you are a state entity or a university entity or a federal entity has a power structure and an understanding structure that is really difficult. Um, so you're already coming in positioned as sort of knowing more. And then if you put people on a map and say like, did you know that you're one of the worst school districts or one of the worst communities or one of the, and it's hard not to use the word worst because when you see the bright red or the bright colors, everyone knows <laughs> that that is not something great. So hearing communities, it, it became very important to me to not necessarily show this information as a way to tell communities about themselves, but use it as a conversation for communities to say what they loved about themselves so much. In many of our Pueblo communities, for example, what was important, test scores were great. It isn't that they didn't care about test scores or anything else, but what was most important were indigenous language programs. Um, it is great that you can show that you're so important in math, but what was important was keeping up traditions, for example. And the reason that I'm belaboring all of this is I, it made me want to be very centered in hearing from communities what they needed first. Um, and so in our work, we believe, I, I have a geology background, I have this, in, this education background, and one of the things that we try to do is, in our technical partnerships, find a way to take what communities are saying and take it back to our technical team so that if somebody says what's really important is an indigenous language program or what's really important is keeping our kids in the community through pipeline education or what's really important is sending our kids to the best school in the state, whatever it is that they say, that we can build some of those important measures into our community benefits plans or our technical programs or our internship programs in order to have sort of a, a lasting partnership between what's being developed and what the communities need. So I appreciate your uh, letting me talk about New Mexico. We lived here a long time. It's fantastic. And I guess I feel like many of the programs that have been here um, with the diversity of voices and the diversity of experiences are a great model for how we should approach communities when we're talking about energy projects. Thank you, Erin. That was really helpful to get the grounding for where we are. Maren. Am I on? Yes, okay, good. Hi, uh, everybody. I'm Melon Tesfaye. I'm with the Bipartisan Policy Center. Um, I'm, um, your, your framing was excellent. I don't know how to follow that, but um, just to kind of, uh, I have a background, technical background, and have been sort of transitioning into policy for the last four years, and that translation piece that you talk about in that dialogue from the technical to the policy to the communities, very essential, and at the Bipartisan Policy Center, this issue of community engagement, uh, you know, the way we think about it is really that 
uh, communities don't see technologies in the silos that we work in. They don't think about them as carbon management or CCS or DAC or hydrogen. They see them as, is this solution gonna solve the problem that is before me? And so that kind of framing has really shaped our thinking on this and has also shaped uh, how we try to build consensus across different party lines. And that's um, the way um, I'm approaching the work, but we can talk more about that. Thank you, Marin. And I want to just point out one thing I forgot to mention um, when we sat down. Um, this panel is no accident. Um, all of these um, panelists uh, have really interesting insight, and you, you heard Arcelia talk about renewable energy. I think what we're seeing as we think about carbon management and all of the siting and permitting and all those challenges, it's a lot of sort of repeating the lessons of what you are learning and have learned, I think, with renewables. And then the New Mexico examples, and then Marin talking about policy, right, and how policy and then um, the community engagement piece sort of work together. It's no accident that these three folks are here, and I, I want to also give a shout out to GPI, um, because this conversation, and indeed all of the conversations that we're having over these two days, need to be centered around people of color and women, and not just men. And this panel is people of color and women, so well done. Um, <laughs> these are the folks who need to be in the room leading these conversations, and um, I think you're gonna see why as we talk. So I wanna do two things to get started. So the first is just a reminder, the name of this session is Building Trust, Engaging Communities and the Public in the Siting of Carbon Management and Other Clean Energy Projects. So we're gonna talk about trust, I think, a little bit today. And I wanna just start with a quote, um, and Patrice is gonna roll her eyes, but um, it's from um, an E&E news story about 10 days ago, and it's a quote from Brad Crabtree. Um, I think I may be the first person to mention his name here, but Brad is a former GPI um, staffer who helped get all this stuff off the ground, and he is now the Assistant Secretary for the Fossil Energy and Carbon Management Program at DOE. And he, it was a story that Patrice actually circulated um, a couple weeks ago to us, and it's a quote I thought was really useful in terms of thinking about community engagement. So I'm gonna throw it out there and let our panelists just sort of talk about it a little bit. So it's a little long, forgive me, I'll try, to, I'll try to get through it. Companies and governments need to go in before project designs are even finalized, before engineering studies are completed, before there are even permit applications, and engage with communities. Find out what their interests and concerns are and to the extent feasible, address those concerns in project design. So starting with sort of how do we do this, right? First, why do we keep doing it wrong? <laughs> why is it so hard? <laughs> What's the right way to do it? I thought Brad's quote there was an interesting sort of starting point in terms of what do we think of that? And, and is that the whole story? Is that part of it? Is that a good starting point? Anybody want to jump in and talk about that? Um, yeah, I can take a stab at it. <laughs> from our experiences with the work that I've done and the people that I've gotten to, to me, we've kind of come across situations oftentimes that the people that are approving your projects, you know, the people that are in charge, they're not always reflective of the larger community. You know, we have these precedents, these regulations that honestly vary from community to community. Um, and when you have um, like these standards that you know you have to be checking off, like these, these um, like you have to have a hearing, you have to do this, you have to submit this, you have to do this study. Um, it's not always working with, um, with all of the people that are uh, reflective of the larger community. Um, so sometimes this is what we say takes a little bit more work up front uh, to make sure that we're making uh, like information accessible to the communities um, and putting in the work up front to make sure that we're not assuming that just because we're getting approvals from the people that we need to be getting approvals that that means that the larger community is in approval of it. You know, it's a little bit more of uh, extra work that you have to do because the precedents are still very much uh, being made <laughs> and uh, they're not quite there yet. So I would say that's kind of a, a way to, um, in agreement of, of that quote, I think. Thank you, anyone else? I saw heads nodding. Yeah, I can, I can um, add on to, to Arcelia's excellent point. Um, I, it's, it's so true that I think really because we're talking about this issue of building trust to also think about lack of trust that existed prior, uh, whether that is through uh, specific developer activity or history of discrimination or um, you know some of the uh, points that you raised, I think that broken trust has to be evaluated and looked at as we approach communities and uh, 
some of their skepticism is coming from previous history and uh, how we do the remedial work we do uh, is, is to engage that community meaningfully, engage them early, um, uh, you know, be accountable to, to the promises uh, that we make. And, and I think um, even that may still not get us all the way to building trust, but it's something that has to be done early. Thank you, Aaron. I think the only thing that I'd add is um, a lot of our work is doing community benefits plans, which follows a, a very formulaic approach from the federal government. Um, and there's so much money in this that many people are taking the opportunities to start new projects in this way. One of the tensions that we have, we sort of believe in engaging early and often, absolutely. But one of the tensions that we have is when projects are in a developmental stage that they may not actually materialize after 18 months or two years. And one of the things that we're trying to understand is how we can build partnerships to keep some of this work going so that just because you go in with a project and do work and then you leave, when the next person comes in, but I, I mean, we've all seen the geology maps, right? We've all seen direct air capture maps. There is not a random assortment of places where this stuff can happen. And so there are certain places where we know that there, there are likely to be projects. So our own op opinion is to be very good stewards to any projects that go forward, knowing that whether ours goes or not, this is important for something that is bigger than carbon solutions or bigger than our project or bigger than even the state's needs. And so one of the things we're trying to balance is how to not overpromise jobs or overpromise things when this project may fail in 18 months because the technology isn't there, but in five years it could be a resounding success. And so it is the engage early and often, it's true, but we're also trying to balance that with sort of not overpromising and having this delicate balance of not educating because it's not like we have all of this information that we're sort of spewing out to people for them to understand, but having whatever we do be part of an ongoing conversation that we're trying to figure out honestly, how can we capture this? Is it reports? Is it internet websites? Is it, what is it? So that if we do surveys or if we do listening sessions, that somebody coming in can see this without having to tap the community again for more information. And so I think it's, a, it's part of what we're balancing with sort of responsible outreach and, and figuring out how to do that at the right time. So I heard trust and balance and, and respect and um, lots, of, lots of kind of core principles that I think we should talk about. But I wanna sort of build on that foundation now that we've kind of gotten that sort of initial thought uh, together. And I wanna just ask some basic questions that I think will give you guys a chance to really help the audience understand a little bit more about the challenges and maybe some of the solutions as well. So first one, um, you know, going back a minute, what are some of the common community and landowner concerns about building carbon management and other clean energy projects? I mean, we heard Marin talking about trust, right? And broken trust and you're coming in to do what? When, how, where, why, you know? What are some of the concerns and, and what are you seeing and what have you seen in the experience uh, that, that you've had, each, each of you, or anyone who wants to tackle it? Yeah, I can go again if that's okay. Um, I think for, for us, one of the most common concerns that comes up um, is uh, kind of a fear of, a no of an unknown for sure, but I think the most common thing that people say is, uh, well, they're not from here. You know, this, this company is based out of state, is based out of the country. But I think that's kind of building off of what these wonderful panelists have been saying is that there's a history there of, um, you know, kind of knowing not to trust someone unless there's a sure, a sure thing that they will have a vested interest in the community. Like if they see somebody who is part of the community, there's more of an interest, like even if they're serving their own self-interest in these people's eyes, they, they can still be benefiting the larger community because they're part of it. So I think that aspect of it is one thing that comes up a lot for us. Um, and just to give an example, in uh, New Mexico, we're considered a bit of a sacrifice state. So we have a lot of operations in the Permian Basin uh, that has just very much built a lot of deep mistrust in a lot of uh, the communities um, because you have these regulations, for example. I'm like, oh, well, th these things are prohibited. It's like, well, they're, they're doing it out there, like flaring is something, like that's a very common thing that's not allowed. <laughs> And they're doing it and we, our government doesn't have the capacity to do anything about it, even though it's common knowledge that it's a very big problem. 
So when they have people coming in and these new projects and there's not much that's known, especially if it's about carbon capture, it's about these very much newer technologies that's not known as much about them. There's a lot of resistance because there's like, okay, well, what's the precedent? Where has this been done before? What are the safeguards to show that it's been safe to do in other places? Um, and, you know, because we're seen as a sacrifice state out here and some other rural communities kind of have the same interest of, you know, we're, this is how we've been run and things have always done, like been uh, done this way and how can we be sure that this out-of-stater is gonna come in and understand our culture, understand that we're agriculture, that we're, you know, big, um, you know, we're, we're concerned about water conservation, these things. Um, so that's something that is very much a very deep-seated concern is just how can we know that we're um, going to have our best interest at heart um, is definitely one of the central things that branches off into other concerns that I've seen within our communities. Thank you. Karen or, or Maren? Um, I think some of the feedback that we have heard is concern over water quality, um, what is going to happen in the short term and long term with water quality, uh, poor space rights, who's going to get the money, how is it going to be distributed, what happens when people leave, um, who is going, is it the state, is the organization who is going to carry this on in case there are any problems down the line. We, um, in some of the, the listening sessions um, that uh, Matt mentioned earlier in Louisiana, it, it was really interesting to hear folks talk about uh, one of the federal programs that everybody's supposed to write about is diversifying a supply network. Um, and everybody agrees in this, there, there's no problem with this. But some of the folks in Louisiana were talking about previous companies that have come in to try to do that, but the gap between getting recognized as a federal contractor was such that it was really insurmountable to even get on the list of diversifying the suppliers. And so figuring out how to make that a reality is great that everybody says it, but they're like, we've been through this before, and like, use other words. Um, and so hearing the legacy of some of, of past broken promises are, are some of those things. Um, pipeline concerns, where is it gonna be routed? How close is it going to be to folks? Uh, job concerns are, are another thing. Um, I guess I would say I am currently living in Michigan, and one of, the, one of the things that has happened over and over again in Michigan has been Ford has built plants and then left, but because of the, the zoning and the deals that were made by the cities, there's no way for the cities to then take over that infrastructure. And so it's not quite the same thing where some of the wells are located, but where we're talking about big direct air capture facilities or those kinds of things. Is this land leased? Is it not leased? Who's gonna own it later on and who's going to clean up when they leave? So some of the legacies of past things and then some of the environmental concerns are, are some of the things that have been brought up in, in meetings that, that we've been to. Wanna add anything? Yeah, um, if I can quickly add, um, again, echo everything that has already been said. Um, I do think like it, it is probably beneficial to sometimes um, separate landowners from community. I think uh, landowners definitely have a separate interests sometimes from a broader community interests. Um, um, but I, I, I do agree that both are concerned about uh, you know, additional sort of stress that comes to, to their community, whether that is additional um, traffic uh, or um, stress on health services, their fire safety, um, um, you know, protocols or, or educational systems. So, um, you know, th that additional stress on local resources is definitely something that, uh, that we've heard. Um, I think uh, folks are also concerned about, um, you know, what is the decision making? Uh, how can communities um, meaningfully weigh in on decision making about projects. And uh, a lot of that is promised maybe at the top, but it doesn't really carry through. Um, uh, the other thing that we've seen um, with a case study that we looked at on a carbon storage project, uh, this was back in 2010, is that um, political cycles, so the changing administration and then sort of the giving money and then taking away, uh, some of that really does, um, the distrust reverberates uh, and, and actually uh, preempts communities to reject projects even before they come to them. I wanna just pick up on one thing you said before we talk about um, broken promises, which, which Aaron just so eloquently said. Are community and landowner concerns always the same? I mean, I, I heard you saying basically they're not a monolith, right? And I guess there's probably some projects where 
the community or various communities might feel one way and the landowner might feel another. How does that work? And that would almost seem to be like three-dimensional chess kind of thing, right, in terms of how to navigate all that? Yes, I, I will let others weigh, it, <laughs> weigh in on that, but uh, d I, just to begin with, when we were talking about poor space or even uh, you know, pipeline uh, transport or transmission, uh, there's definitely some economic incentives for landowners that may not exist for the rest of the community. So there's, a, from the get-go, there's some differences, um, but there's obviously shared concerns as well. Anyone else wanna? You guys have both been talking about that, so I thought I would go there next. I think it's a, a legitimate concern, and I think I, until these projects start um, coming out, we're not going to understand really the implications of this. And I, I'm saying this, for example, if somebody is a private landowner, you need to go through NEPA compliance. Uh, who knows what's going to happen in terms of whether the DOE dings somebody or not in future funding of projects um, for class six wells, but there exists a world in which folks can do things even without the surrounding community wanting to do something. And I, I think one of the concerns around this is really where the state will play into this because I don't know in, in some of these projects if the state does not have a mechanism for hearing people or needing some sort of community consent or something like that, then it is entirely possible that uh, private landowners, depending on the geography of where sources are and where sinks are and all of those kinds of things, could act without there being a community mandate. And again, I think from our position, our concern is to not, we are trying to avoid that in any way possible, especially for the first projects that are going out. It's not that I don't care about subsequent projects, but we would really like there to sort of be model projects that happen first with uh, community outreach and community buy-in and um, there to be support because the, the land owning part um, for many states could, it, it makes it very tricky um, in terms of where the share of ownership is and to be frank, where the where benefits are for <laughs> landowners versus communities. Do you want to add anything there, Celine? Yeah, no, I think um, definitely agree with what's been said and I think I would just add that um, it's just when you're looking at it from an equity lens, I would also just be mindful of the dynamics um, because people sometimes like there's some situations where um, they own land, but they don't necessarily live in. So then you have that piece of, okay, you're allowing this thing to be built because it doesn't impact you, but it's going to impact your neighbors. Or, you know, more commonly too, that you have um, like the neighbors that uh, don't want to have uh, the views of their neighbors. <laughs> and so you have these interesting dynamics that I think are just very important to uh, be navigating and be aware of when you're going into a given community and understand how the dynamics work in, in those situations. And I think it definitely would be a community by community basis. So I wanna jump to a question um, that one of the registrants actually submitted when they were registering for the conference. I don't know who you are, so if you're in the room and this is you, you can, uh, you can raise your hand and follow up if you want later. Uh, it seems that a lot of projects are approved prior to any community engagement. Who approves the projects at that point and how could community engagement prior to project approval become a requirement? There's about seven hours worth of answer to this question, I think. <laughs> Depends on the state and the locality and the specific rules and the kind of project, but anybody wanna jump in and yeah. talk about all or part of this question? Well, and that's the biggest thing too, is that it's very, very much dependent on a community by community basis, like the ordinances so when you, sorry, to go back a little, when you have your traditional um, energy generations that have been already established, there's very, they've been around much longer and they have very strict parameters for within which they have to be working and they know that they can be working. So sometimes it's even easier to build these new, um, more older facilities than it is to build a more clean energy carbon uh, management projects um, because it does vary. Like every community has their own ordinance of you have to have this many hearings, you have to do this, just this amount of uh, public engagement or just put a notice on the paper. Um, it very much does depend and that's a lot of what we do is try to come in and help to make that more accessible to the public. Um, but yeah, definitely I think that's where um, it's a little bit of the difficulties lie is that it's just so new and it's very much uh, varies so, so vastly. Um, and you know, we can like, we can have, you know, us and uh, the developers even to go into 
to do the work and like try to um, put more work up front, um, but unless there's regulations in place, that's going to be varying um, across the different areas. Anyone else want to jump in on that before I move on? I think from my perspective, and I could be completely wrong about this, everybody has different experiences, but from where I'm sitting in the answering a lot of federal grant space, one of the most exciting things, even though I, I may not want to show communities maps with giant ugly red colors, or you are disadvantaged because of this, and the language is fraught, and all of those kinds of things, I guess one of the most exciting things for me is the, uh, the needing to write any kind of community benefits plans with these projects. I mean, we work with a lot of industry folks who never, it's not because they don't take the time, it's not because anybody's doing anything this, but there's quick deadlines and it's the nature of the, the crazy funding right now. But having community benefits plans means that I always get to show a technical team who's living in this community, what the population is, how far exactly it is. I need to tell them exactly where they think their wells are going to be, who's going to be close. I can show them the aquifers and the migration patterns, and I can show them all of those kinds of things before a project even gets off the ground. And I think especially in the absence of there being state legislation or federal legislation about what would happen with class six wells, for example, or um, with direct air capture, there is a unique opportunity that the federal government has allowed us to come up with some metrics for the first time as a national measure. I did cancer modeling years ago, and it is so crazy because every county can, can report so getting a national map can be absolutely crazy because one county may be great and another county may be terrible. And so the lift that they have done to try to make a national map of all of these different metrics is really quite unique um, compared to what was available 10 years ago. And so being able to have this in a place where we can show um, folks and then to have the project teams need to actually put money on the line um, and whether it's fear or not that there's this 40% that needs to go to somebody who's not them has really given us an opportunity to talk about community benefits and equity and justice in a really exciting way. I, I'm not sure how this will look in two years. I'm really excited to see how it goes. But I, I do appreciate the opportunity to start bringing some of these issues in and integrate them into projects at a time and in a, uh, a timing in terms of the project scope that um, I don't think would have happened otherwise. Gee, if only we had a decision support tool that enabled <laughs> us to learn these things. Wow. <laughs> Marin, do you want to add anything? Um, not a whole lot to add, but just to say, I think, um, you know, like in enabling communities to have that information about whether it's federal funds that are, um, you know, being directed towards them, whether it's local, um, um, you know, new regulations or uh, anything like that. I think um, thinking about those approval makes me think like our, our structure, we need to enable a structure that actually um, allows communities to weigh in on projects that are coming to them. So I think that information sharing, that transparency is gonna be really important, whether it is coming from, you know, non-for-profit or, uh, uh, DOE or, or um, local or uh, state actors. Because you three are so good, you've already started talking about solutions. I want to do <laughs> one final question on, on solutions, and then we're going to open it up to the audience. So get those questions ready. I think we have mics in the room. Yes, so get those ready. But the last question, um, unless no one has questions in the audience, which I'm counting on you to have. Um, you all have sort of talked about this a little bit, so I want to just go a little further on it if we can. How can project developers, policymakers, and community representatives foster a collaborative and inclusive approach to developing clean energy infrastructure? You've all said, hey, hi, <laughs> include everybody. <laughs> How do you do that, right? And maybe if you have examples, I mean, Aaron's sort of given us some already, but if you have examples of folks who've done it right or things you've done or things you've learned, I think that would be really helpful for the audience to hear in terms of, okay, I get it, I have to do it, tell me how to do it. <laughs> Uh, it's very helpful to make things very accessible. Um, I think uh, it was Mr. Travis who said that it's not enough to just kind of you know throw money into the community and hope that's enough to carry everything out. I think having there's more of an expectation to have like a person present and have 
that more human connection to be there and to be present to answer questions. Um, and that's a lot of the work that we've done. We've gone out to uh, rural areas and you know, talked to business owners and you know, told them like, hey, there's this project that's getting proposed. Uh, would you be interested in signing a letter of support and just making it easy for them because people are very busy these days. <laughs> and helping to put a lot of the work up front has gone a really long way to making sure that people's voices are heard. And something that has been very helpful for us as well as just having those relationships uh, within the community beforehand too, because then we know where they're coming from. We know that they care about water. We know what, that they care about, you know, when you bring these projects in, make sure that the, um, the, the materials that you're using are being sourced ethically, not from like companies that use, um, you know, sites on sacred sites and stuff like that. And we're able to help um, streamline that a little bit because uh, it's very hard to get involved. And even when there's like a comment period, um, you know, it's not always easy for people to be able to navigate the websites and stuff. So, you know, helping to put a lot of the work up front has really gone a long way to, to helping to facilitate that um, and definitely um, just bringing more people in and making it accessible, making sure that there's, you know, fact sheets like a person, making sure that things are translated um, to the languages that are in the local community. Um, and just doing what you can to make it accessible has really, I think, been a very prominent um, success for us in the work that we've done in getting these projects up and running. Thank you. Anyone else before we open it up to the audience? Yeah, I, I think the, um, the role of trusted uh, local voices or uh, local partners on the, crown, on the ground is very essential. Um, this is also something we are thinking even at the policy level um, on how to enable more of that, meaning uh, not just to kind of um, uh, support project deployment, but uh, just to um, ensure that communities know their te technology options, communities know their funding options, and when they do say yes or when they say no, that they are making decisions based on um, useful information uh, and that they have th that grounding um, it is still up to them to decide, but uh, using those trusted voices to kind of provide that information is really essential. Uh, of course, we, we've already said engaging folks early is, is, is huge. Um, and I think also meeting their needs uh, where they're at is, which was uh, the example from earlier from the panel is like, it's showing that it's not, yeah, uh, just the money's not enough, but actually solving the, the, the needs on the ground. Thank you. Um, the only thing that I'd add to Arsili and Marin is the one of the things that we've tried to do in our projects is this real balance between local knowledge and expertise uh, across projects. Um, and it's not that somebody's an expert in one community versus another, but when you see how things are going in several different communities, sometimes you're able to say, gosh, we need to expand these options and give communities these three different things that they may be able to invest in. Or it, it's just all learning from one another. And I, I guess one of the things that is helpful is to be perfectly honest, opportunities like this. Um, so often we're existing on these projects all over the country and we don't have a chance to meet one another. So even here, I've talked to other people who are working on community benefits. Um, this is a fraught space. Anybody knows it's competitive. It's, there's money on the table. Nobody knows what's going to happen. But I think for those of us who are willing to speak to one another and talk about what's working and what isn't working and, um, and have that collaboration amongst the people who are doing this work is important. And I, I think the only other thing that I'd add is, um, well, it, it's saying the same thing, is having local folks on the ground is extremely important. And so having the partnerships with the people, I, I think this is especially true for direct air capture companies, for example, who are often entering the space without a lot of experience in community outreach. Um, but having folks that are able to have somebody in the local community or contact the local community and have those conversations with a chamber of commerce or a school superintendent or whatever else to just say, hey, did you know that we're coming here? It doesn't have to be formal, it doesn't have to be a giant presentation, but just having those kinds of conversations that come in, and especially if these projects don't get funded, you're not promising anything, but you are building up a relationship um, in case it ends up going forward. And so I, I think lots of projects are doing this, um, but I think those that seem to be the most successful are, are doing this, um, doing that part early and often. 
So I, thank you. I was overly ambitious. We have time for one question. I see a hand right there. I don't know if we have, oh, here comes Angela with the mic, so just give her a sec. Uh, thank you so much for all of your comments. They were uh, very insightful. Um, so, so just a question that we consistently get as we're developing some of the community benefits plans. Uh, sorry, Darlin Roberts from Visage Energy. Um, is how do you define the radius of the community? And then how do you deal with the fact that perhaps the radius is large enough that it overlaps multiple communities that might have different EJ metrics that they're dealing with, might have different uh, sort of ways that they're looking at um, kind of job creation. Um, and how, what do you do if, 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 you, if you define it too broadly and so that you can you know, incorporate a disadvantaged community? How do you sort of um, divide up kind of the local impacts to the longer term perhaps benefits from a job creation standpoint or from a STEM-based training standpoint? So yeah, if, if you could speak to any of that. And I'll say we have about two minutes left, so whoever answers, no pressure. I can jump in quickly. I don't have the answer, so we can like exchange notes later. I, I think for ours, one of the things that we're trying to do is imagine anybody who could come into that community. So because, for example, in New Mexico, this is a great example, but other places, there's often communities, uh, uh, commuting patterns of where people send their schools, their kids to schools, how far people commute to jobs. That answer is sometimes available in the data, uh, local, regional, um, if there's a strategic plan, they often have where the network is <laughs> where people live in terms of homework. But then it's also important to talk to the community and say, where, how do you define community? So before, it's hard because you're writing, you may be writing an application, but like our next step is just to go into communities and have them define communities themselves and so have this sort of like continuous improvement of what a community is. It's messy, but that's kind of our approach. Anyone else? We have a little bit of time. Go for it. Um, I will add for us, when we've gone out to talk to communities and we know there's a project that's being proposed in a particular area, we will go to that county and the surrounding counties because when we talk, especially for the jobs aspect, you know, the, the people, um, when you bring in the workers and you have that economic boost, you get a lot of benefits of people wanting to travel into those areas. So anybody that we see could um, get some impact is the people that we go to inform uh, about these opportunities to, to participate in the application processes. Marin, you get the last word. Oh, okay. Well, <laughs> I, I think it's a hard question, but I, I always lean uh, towards my friend Rudra over there, who's always talking about um, justice and mercy when, when we talk about projects and climate and uh, communities. And I think that's the lens I look at, and, and I think uh, a, a project that serves the least of these uh, is likely to benefit the, the broader community as well. So I want to ask one thing that I just thought of as we were sitting here. Um, we can start wherever we, you want. Do, give me a word or phrase that you want the audience to remember today about community engagement. One word or a phrase. You, you guys have used a lot already, so just pull something out of what you said. But I, they're all good, so just pick one. <laughs> Anybody? say intentional. Okay, intentional. Marin, Celia? It, you, I think it doesn't have to be the one, just a one that's good. Building trust. I'll say building, building trust, building intentional, trust. and or Celia, you I'll get the last. Out. I know. <laughs> um, put in the work. <laughs> put in the work. <laughs> but not just, but across the board, and the, the leaders, the you know, developers, the communities too, who also need to start getting more engaged uh, not just out of outrage, I would say. They also need to put in the work, speak up when they believe in something, too. <laughs> so I did that for a reason. So the tagline <laughs> of my firm is restoring common sense to communication. So much of community engagement is common sense, right? You've heard it today, right? It's if you're old enough to remember that book, Everything I Need to Know I Learned in Kindergarten. Mm -hmm. That's what community engagement is. It's respecting other people, engaging with other people, and really thinking about how you can do things together. So the thing I want to leave folks with, just as you think about all the great insight you got from these panelists, communities, landowners, the folks that you're working with as you, as you develop projects, they're not the other. They are you. You heard it this morning from the former war chief from Santa Ana Pueblo, right? We're all related. And that isn't just a nice thing to say to make us feel good in the morning. It's true. And it's particularly as you think about project development, and you think about all the challenges we have, if you approach it from the standpoint of we're all related, we're all in this together, 
going to make it that much easier to get to where you need to go. So thanks very much for listening, and have a great rest of the conference.